<laughs> um, this is John Chudsky. He's a professor in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering. He's also a state specialist in farm safety uh, with the Division of Extension, which used to be called Cooperative Extension. And he's had a really cool talk. As you see in this tractor, there's a key thing that's missing. And that's a three-point hit. Oh, there's a, oh, the next picture. Sorry, the next one. Well, uh, I, I've got lots of got pictures. Yeah. So he's got pictures of tractors with no people on it. Mm -hmm. And this is a very cool question. Like, how do you keep the farm stead, the farm fields, the farm roads safe when you have uh, autonomous vehicles? And I think you have other issues you're going to talk yeah. about. But that's the one that certainly has my attention. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you the five questions that I ask everybody. John, where were you born? I was born in Valparaiso, Indiana, um, just in the shadow of Chicago, Porter County, Indiana. Way to go. And then where did you go to high school? I went to high school, a little town, Coutts. You clapped. Are you are you from that area? Uh, I went to Chesterton High School. Chesterton, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, Coutts. Our kids were both born in the Valparaiso High School. So K-O-U-T-S. Yeah, I was born in Porter Memorial. I've been in Coutts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back home we'll go. <laughs> I'm thinking Jim Neighbors just rolled over in the tree. Okay, and then where'd you go for your undergrad and what you study? I got all three of my degrees at Purdue, uh, Boilermaker, although I, I do really enjoy Badger sports. It's a cool place to be. Great. And what did you get your degrees in? Um, I got my undergraduate degree in what they used to call agricultural mechanization. It was an applied form of agricultural engineering, a little bit less calculus, a little bit less physics. But then when I got my master's and PhD, I actually went back, back and took some remedial. I was, I was a PhD student in several freshman calculus classes. How did that make you feel? Agricultural <laughs> engineering. And I specifically looked, um, my PhD work just quickly, I looked at 4,000 burned, burned up fires, combines, tractors, sugarcane harvesters, and cotton pickers. And we developed a sensing and uh, like a detection and an extinguishing system yeah. so that this stuff could happen automatically, which actually kind of ties together a little bit with my presentation. Today. What did you extinguish with? Uh, ABC dry chemical. Whoa. Well, we looked at a number of chemicals. Obviously, water is a possibility, but if you use water on oil, as you know, if you've ever had a stovetop fire, you spread it. Um, halon was another chemical, although halon about the time we're doing the research had all kinds of environmental issues and concerns, very effective, but ultimately landed on ABC dry chemical. Good, the stuff that we have in our kitchen. Yeah. Very, very you, just, you just need a lot of it and need to get the fire early. Good. Well, that's enlightening. And when did you come? Oh, you were at Minnesota for a while? <laughs> I was in Minnesota uh, from 1990, which seems like ancient history to 2008, and I came here to be an associate dean and program director for Extension Ag Programs. That's where I met you. Yep. And I returned to faculty after uh, eight years in administration, which, which, you know, that's long enough. I came back to the faculty in 2016. Very so, good. Yeah. All right. Well, would you please join me in welcoming John Chutsky. Thank you. Well, it's good to have a fellow Porter County person here. Uh, Purdue. Purdue, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah just saw, in fact, uh, just, I'll just tell this story really quickly. So my family, there's a lot of Shutskis in the Coutts, Indiana area. Um, however, in September of 2021, there were about five fewer of us. My father actually, uh, middle part of COVID, right after Thanksgiving, they traveled back down to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, like we kind of begged my parents to stay put for an extra few months until we get the vaccines and stuff like that. My dad ended up getting sick, spent about 10 days in the ICU, died on, uh, on uh, January 1st, so New Year's Day in 2021. So we helped my mom sell the home place. My dad had retired back in 2008, but in 2021, he continued to be involved with farm work. He worked for a local co-op in Malden, Indiana. That's tiny. It's actually halfway between Coutts and Valpo, and, and he was working in October, he was working 60 hours a week at H81. So I do have a pretty, you know, deep farm background. As Tom said, um, I do still call myself a farm or agricultural safety and health specialist. I don't want to go deep into the health part of things. Talk about antibiotics, Tom, one of the big projects I have going right now is looking at the role of farm, uh, farm workers on dairy farms 
and how their exposure to antibiotics that are being given to cows and calves, how that affects issues connected to resistance. I'm not necessarily looking to do a presentation on that here, but, but it is like a health aspect of agriculture. The other thing I wanna just say, I think about the world from more of like an engineering perspective, like how do we solve some of these problems of farm accidents or farm related health problems? Um, I do remember a kind of a fateful day. I got a phone call probably in October of 2001, about a month after 9-11, and I had some colleagues in Minnesota who said, so what are you going to do now that 9-11 has happened? And I said, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think things are going to look a lot different. And what I heard of that was people are no longer going to care about farm accidents, tractor rollovers, people getting wrapped up in PTOs because the risk situation now with 9-11 has totally changed. So I ended up spending about four or five years before I came here working in Homeland Security we had something called the, the U.S. It was a Center for Food Protection and Defense. So I worked across the country and actually up into Canada on food, sort of food security from a from a homeland security perspective. At that time, we were quite concerned about people sort of intentionally tampering with or like attacking our agricultural and food supply. So that's probably more background than you wanted to hear. No, that's great. Um, I wanted to, to just, uh, what I'm going to talk about are some current issues in farm safety in Wisconsin and beyond. I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm going to call D3, D to the third power work. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. What are some of the possibilities and the benefits and risks, like Tom said, of new highly automated up to including fully autonomous equipment used in agriculture. I'll give you a few examples. I'll show you a couple of cool videos. Um, the one from on YouTube, Tom, I'm not sure if I'm going to show the whole video, but I will just show a little clip of it if you want to go home. And there's some really, really interesting and exciting stuff that's that's happening. And then I'm, I want to be really careful. I want to be agnostic about technology. As an engineer, I think, oh, there's some really cool. Like I, I'm one of the first people to get the new iPhone or the new iPad. But I want to be a little bit careful. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying we have to move forward with tech. The reality is we will. And so what is it going to take? What, what is it going to take to be able to do that safely and in a smart way? And, and Tom, just to tie back to some of the suggestions that were coming up, you talked about uh, solar power, for example, becoming increasingly environmentally friendly. Last week, actually exactly a week ago today, I was in Grant County. I don't know if anybody's been over the highway between uh, uh, Dodgeville and Fenimore. I think it might be Highway 18, if I'm not mistaken. It is. There's a place that you pass and what you're actually looking at, you see solar panels on both sides of the road. It's about as far as you can see. And I thought, wow, that's probably several hundred acres of solar panels. And what I was seeing there was just the northern tip. If you go south of there, I was told by the people at Southwest Tech College, 6,500 acres mm. of farmland. That's 10 square taken. miles? 6,500 acres. <laughs> Uh, 6,500 acres is 10 square miles. 6,500, yeah. Oh, I thought you said 6,500 square miles. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 65, good. yeah, you're right. 10 plus, right? Um, yeah, 6,500 acres of solar panels. And he and this was Corey, the ag instructor at Fenimore. He said, that's prime farmland. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I, there's, there's pros and cons as we move towards these new types of technologies. And one of the things that I'll talk about briefly is some of the environmental concerns with new highly automated technology. So let's talk a little bit about risk. Um, is there really a more risk-filled industry than agriculture? I, I know that that's a rhetorical question. How many of you actually grew up on farms or had people in your family closely connected to agriculture? Okay, so about half of you. Um, Rhetorically, I would say, no, there is no more risk-filled job. There is no more risk-filled type of industry. Uh, workplace safety, I'm gonna show you a piece of data here in just a second. This, you will be the first audience on the planet to see this next slide. I think it's my next slide. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you some new data on farm fatalities from the state of Wisconsin that we are just getting ready to put out. I think it will officially come out on Friday or possibly Monday next week. Um, Labor. Right now, if you have family or friends or you're involved in farming yourself, labor is a huge issue right now. 
there are many parts of the state, like up in the Fox River Valley, up through Green Bay on north, and even up in Wausau, and uh, you know, the central part of the state, big dairy part of the state, even here in Dane County, labor has really become an issue. In many cases, farmers are saying like, we don't have any choice other than to automate because we just simply cannot find workers. I've heard stories of farmers that are paying uh, non-English speakers, Spanish speaking immigrant workers as much as $30 an hour, and they're still having trouble attracting and uh, attracting and retaining people. And there's so much competition within, and it's, it's not just dairy farming, it's all aspects, including tractor driving, some of the other things. There's a lot of economic uncertainty, obviously, weather, costs, uh, global, sort of global uh, macroeconomic situation. Think about COVID, you think about the war in Ukraine, a lot of stuff that's really impacted in both directions, farming and agriculture, just a lot of risk. And then there's also this amazing cost, a cost to get into the industry. You said you used to be a, an ag teacher? No. If you've got young people, I get these phone calls a lot. In the College of Ag, we get a lot of just random phone calls. What would it take for me to become a farmer? And that the cost of getting in, into this industry and actually you know, making a decent living, being able to support a family, it's, it is almost impossible these days. It's not impossible, but it is, it is difficult. There's a lot of change happening, expansions, and reconfigurations. And, and we're talking, in, in the case of even but a modestly sized uh, dairy farm here in Wisconsin. We're talking about in the millions of dollars, the larger farms, there might be as many as 50 to 100 of those. We're talking $10 million plus of investment product moving onto and off of the farm. So there's just so much risk. The one area that I do pay a lot of attention to is the risk for agricultural workers. So the data from 2019 and 2020, these are the things that we have not yet released to the public. This will probably, I'm guessing, may or may not be in the Wisconsin State Journal. Um, we're going to release the data, 40 fatalities in 2019 and, and also 28 in 2020. We've kind of revamped uh, the College of Agricultural Life Sciences. We used to have a Center for Agricultural Safety and Health. And we're now, that's been moved out of CALS. And so we're reconfiguring and we're moving to work with the National Farm Medicine Center, which is in Marshfield, Wisconsin. We've done a really, you know, I will call it almost a CSI style investigation to get these data working in partnership with, um, in particular, for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, uh, a lot of different organizations have helped contribute into this. I will also say that if you look at Wisconsin agriculture, we have as many as 10 to 12 thousand, we're talking 12,000 people just in the state of Wisconsin who are injured. And when I say injured, the definition is unconsciousness or amnesia, four or more hours of lost work time or productivity, or people had to see a medical professional, including, by the way, a chiropractor or a veterinarian, which is where some people in the past have saw some of their health care for injuries. Interestingly, of that 12,000 people, about 80% of those people, in fact, did require some type of either a visit to the emergency room, clinic, going in to get splinted or casted, or whatever it might be, or in some cases, multiple days. And that's 12,000 each year? Uh, 12,000 annually, yes. Wow. The number is actually, uh, it's about 19.5% of, of all the farms in the state will be the site of a, of a farm accident or injury in a given year. I don't have to use the word accident, just really quick side note. I don't like to use the word accident. If you look at accident in the Webster's Dictionary, it'll say something that happens as a result of ch a chance, fate, or luck. And these things are not chance, fate, or luck. These things are predictable. Um, I worked in the insurance industry for a while, and that was my job, was predicting when injuries and, and fatalities were going to occur. So, so that's kind of, we are a risk-filled industry. That risk includes people risk. Generally, much of agriculture is, it fits this definition of D to the third power, uh, tasks that are dull, dirty, and dangerous. Now, I grew up on a farm. I want to be really careful. I grew up on a farm. I spent tons of time in the field with my dad. I worked as a hired student for, you know, lots of semesters. I paid my way through college in part by doing farm-related work. So I don't want to diminish the value of farm work. And I'm so grateful and 
and happy that I was able to bring forward into my, my current career. You know, there's things like work ethic and being able to show up to work on time on the farm. We didn't have, we didn't really have a choice. But what's really important is in other industries, these other D3 industries have gradually moved toward more and more automation and autonomy. Manufacturing, mining, construction, a little bit less so, but we all know about manufacturing, right? Like the car you're driving was probably assembled by a robot and 25 or 35 years ago, that work was all done. It was still done with machines, but there was still a lot of hand uh, back wrenching manual labor that went in. Mining has actually gone very much toward fully autonomous operations where you have, yeah, you have big mine trucks and excavators and other types of machines, but a lot of that work is being done without a human being sitting up in the seat. Construction is gradually moving that direction. Agriculture is one of the latter industries to move toward more and more automation and more and more, especially autonomy. And the difference is an autonomous vehicle, I can send it out to do its job and I don't necessarily have to be in the seat or even controlling it because a lot of that control is actually happening through software, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the things that we're now beginning to hear more and more about. Um, let me also say one thing. When I was a grad student, Tom asked me about my, my uh, undergraduate and graduate career of mining. When I was a grad student back in 1985, Mining was head and shoulders above agriculture. It was the most dangerous occupation. And part of why mining is now different, it takes fewer people, so you have less exposure. And then again, the degree of automation and autonomy has really, it's really improved their track record. Meanwhile, if I go back to this data here, if you look at agriculture, in comparison to all of these other industries combined, our fatality rate in production agriculture is seven to eight times higher on a per capita basis. So, you know, I don't wanna say it's embarrassing, but we, we really do, I, I think, need to take this issue quite seriously. Uh, yesterday, I was speaking to a group, it's called Professional Dairy Producers of Wisconsin. We talked a little bit about some of the innovations that transformed agriculture. And there's lots of websites and there's lots of top 10 lists and there's, po there's kind of posters like you see here with the, you know, the developments and timelines over time. A couple of the ones that we know are important, the understanding of genetics, that includes both animal and plant genetics, um, the development of hybrid crops, the Haber-Bosch process that allowed us to extract, I don't know if extract is quite the right word, but to get nitrogen from the air in order to create nitrogen fertilizer more efficiently. But then there's a ton of machines, right? Cotton gin, steam engine, tractors, hydraulics, combine, uh, a lot of like uh, things that also kind of are subsets of these, electronic monitors and control systems, a, a ton of different things. And one of the things that I just, if you see cotton gin, cotton gin has a little asterisk by it. And the reason I wanted to note that is a lot of positive things have happened, but when we developed the cotton gin back, uh, would be more than 200 years ago, it made, it suddenly made the production of cotton in our South and Southeastern states quite profitable. At the same time, profitability, ooh, more demand for cotton or more, more, more of it is being grown by farmers. You can see here that it had profound implications for slavery. And actually the number of slaves uh, increased by 70% or in some parts of the country even more. So one of the things that I'm doing, we talk about risk. Yeah, you got the nuts and bolts of safety, getting, you know, getting hurt on the farm, getting run over by a tractor. That's all important. But I think it's also important that we keep in mind some of these like societal implications that may be unintended consequences as a result of some of these things occurring. Um, this is a slide, what it says up at the top. It's the livestock technology sector. And this is actually a, a chart from 2018. And I don't expect you to like know all these companies, but you can see this is not just like a little blip on the radar. There are a lot of companies that are going all in on the development of technology. This is from 2018. If I took that same slide today and I condensed it down and I, and I updated it for 2022, gotta remember which year we're in, 2022, 
it would have about 33%, about third, one third fewer companies. And the reason for that is not because we see one third fewer uh, pieces of technology, it's because of a lot of consolidation. There, I, I was out in Fresno, California about a month ago, and there are so many companies that are these little small, like one and two and three person. You might have a venture capitalist putting money in, you've got a couple engineers. They may or may not have any farm background, but they got this really cool idea. And if that idea shows promise, oftentimes they get bought up. Um, and some of the examples, this is not one that's gotten bought, bought up. This is a, a large company that is currently selling a lot of product here in Wisconsin. This is an automated, a fully automated robotic autonomous feeder. And large, large scale, as big as a traditional um, non-automated piece of equipment. What you see here is it's, you know, it's mixed, it's gathering the feed, it's mixing the feed, and then it's distributing the feed. You may also have a machine like the little R2D2 on the left. And this machine is actually going back uh, along the bumps here and, and pushing. It's called a feed pusher. How did we normally do feed pushing for those of you who grew up on a farm? Sweep it on with a broom or scoop shovel, right? And some of the bigger farms, we literally have workers going from barn to barn or from building to building. And that's all they're doing is they're moving feed all day. And the idea is like you, the more food, the more feed you can get in front of a dairy cow or a heifer or a cat, like the more you can feed them and give them the food as they need it, the more they're gonna produce. Um, on the right hand side, does anybody know what that is? This is from World Dairy Expo about a little bit over a month ago. Yeah, that is an automated milking system, also referred to as a milk a robot where basically the cow enters, the cow is identified, the cow is fed according to that cow's history and production. That cow is, is clean and, and, uh, and, and you know, clean so that it's gonna produce um, safe milk and then it is milked. And about the time the cow is ready to go, it opens up and she's out of there and can return pretty much anytime she wants to return. And it's really has, I don't want to say it's dramatically improved milk production, but it does have that capacity. You can milk more times during the day and you can also be a lot more custom. That The big benefit, however, is the potential to save labor. Um, and I'll come back and talk about that in a moment. Was the collar on that cow a, just a transponder or does it emit? Um, does it emit? Well, it, it will pop, it will be emitting a signal and um, identifying that cow by number and by its history and how many pounds of milk it gave last time, how many pounds of food it ate, okay. that sort of thing. Uh, radio frequency, most likely. I mean, there's all kinds of different technologies that are being used. And, and actually that space is, being, is changing pretty rapidly as well. This is what the crop slide looks like for crop related equipment. Um, you do see some big companies that maybe some of you grew up with here, companies like Case IH or now CNH, John Deere, Kloss, Agco. So the same thing is happening. When I was out in Fresno, the majority of the activity out there was around the crop side. So we got to meet with a lot of these, like literally you would have like a young MBA who was right out of Stanford or Berkeley or San Francisco. And, you know, they've got access to money because they're working with a venture capital company and they might be working with some hotshot tech people. A lot of it's happening in California around that San Francisco Bay area. And if they are successful, they're gonna get snapped up pretty quickly by some of the bigger players who will probably incorporate some of that technology into their uh, DNA, I guess. Um, so this is one everybody recognizes my, you know, my dad, in, in my case, my dad was a John Deere guy. Although the first tractor I ever learned to drive was a red Farmall 460. Um, I was 12 years old, by the way, a safety issue. Um, John Deere, so let me ask you this question. Has anybody here ever been to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas? Uh, have you ever been, Tom? No. Yeah, if you ever have the chance, I mean, maybe it's just me because I'm a techie type of guy. I was able to go in 2015, actually negotiated being able to do this after I spent a year in the provost's office. It's like, oh, I want to go out and learn more about technology. It's huge. We're talking like between 100,000 and 200,000 people. It essentially takes over the whole city of Las Vegas. 
all kinds of cool stuff. The year I was out there, they were first introducing 5G cellular wireless connectivity. There was also a lot of emphasis in 2015 on health devices like Fitbits and the new software at that time with Apple and monitoring health and those kinds of things. This year, and by the way, this happens right after the first of the year. This year in Las Vegas, John Deere was one of the featured companies. And I will tell you, it's not because it is not because there are tons of farmers who attend the Consumer Electronics Show. They wanted to begin to get customers and the general public used to seeing these kinds of machines out there operating. You know, if I come, I live in Cross Plains, and if I come up to the intersection of Highway P and, uh, you know, just name, a, name an intersection out there, Mineral Point Road, P and Mineral Point Road, and I see this tractor coming and it's got a tillage implement behind it. I typically, if I meant the four-way, I'm gonna make eye contact because I don't wanna end, end up running into that. So, so again, what they're trying to do is they know, and Tom, you know this really well, if you're gonna introduce new technology in agriculture, getting the consumer to at least be aware of it, is, is pretty darn important. So that's why they were there. Um, this is another example. I still think this thing looks super cool. It's, it's actually not stainless steel, it's, um, but it, they buff it out and everything. So it looks like a stainless steel. This is a sprayer. This is a crop sprayer that is being used actively out in California for orchards, vineyards, and other types of specialty crop farms in the state of California. It is fully autonomous. You load this thing with a pesticide, like an insecticide or herbicide and with water, you know, maybe some oil to mix things and make things adhere better to plants or insects. And then this thing goes out and it does its thing. It can do its thing 24 seven. The other thing about machinery like this, it's able to operate at night because of the technology that's out there, which is very desirable in California. Number one, because of the heat and the climatic conditions, but also, uh, farmers like to kind of, in some cases, kind of keep some of that activity a little bit less visible to the public. I mean, let's face it, it's, it's a little bit of a PR move as well, although it's more because of the production benefits. And it's also because I can go 24-7. So if I'm going 24-7, I'm going to have to operate at night, and I can't find workers if I'm spraying orchards who are willing to go out and operate at, in the middle of the night in the dark. And if I do, I'm going to have to pay them a ton of money not to mention the safety benefits that we have by keeping a person off of a piece of equipment like this. I am going to go ahead. I am going to go ahead and just briefly show you a little snippet on this video because I do think it's pretty cool. Um, unless we have something else that pops up here. Oh come on! You gotta love Windows, right? A little bit of a disclaimer. I'm not sure why. Herschel Walker is front and center. I have no interest in endorsing or supporting Herschel Walker. How many do you have to get rid of this? Maybe if I just click over the top. So I, I mentioned uh, my father uh, having passed away and, and growing up on the Farmall 460 and then later the John Deere 4020 and the 4240 and all those kinds of things. Had I known this kind of thing was coming, I don't know if I'd be here today. I might, I might still be home farming with my dad. And I'm not quite sure if he had ever paid much attention to some of these things that are coming down the road. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a second because for younger generations, we struggle to get young people to come and stay in agriculture, and this actually does present some promise. It, if we go back to this one, we're talking here a million plus dollars worth of equipment just in the tractor, right? It's not just the big investment. 
We also see smaller applications, like literally something that's the size of a picnic cooler, um, this little robot. And you know, yesterday I'm talking to dairy farmers who might have 500 or 1,000 acres of corn silage and alfalfa. And they're like, yeah, something the size of a picnic cooler, what's that gonna do for me? But what is happening in some parts of the world, in particular in Europe, they have what they call swarms. So multiple, you might have a custom business that has a truck or a trailer loaded with 30 of these. And as a service, they will come in and perform some type of a specialty or specialized operation. You know, this one was hooked up with a little tiller device. It could be a weeder. Um, so you might think, oh yeah, that's Europe, not here in the US. So in two weeks ago, it was in Champaign-Urbana and we were looking at swarm robots that looked just like this one, except on top it had a bin that was loaded with about a hundred pounds of seed multiple units out in a cornfield underneath growing corn, the corn canopy applying or seeding cover crops. Mm -hmm. And because you were directly seeding and you could, uh, you could see corn plants as it went along as able to optimize the seeding rate at a relatively low cost. You're not having to fly over with an airplane and just randomly scatter seeds, much more of a precision type of an application. So the scales, you can see that there's all kinds of interest, there's all kinds of opportunities and possibilities. Just one, I think this is my last uh, example, kind of show and tell example. This looks like a Lego type of deal, but this is actually a real machine called a burrow. The company's called Burrow. And think of this, so many, many of our farms, larger dairy, livestock, maybe crop farms, but a lot of the livestock farms have a utility vehicle, right? could be an ATV, it could be a four-wheeler with a trailer in the back, and they might be transporting feed, bales, tools, veterinary supplies. If it's a cow-calf operation, they might have a UTV that goes out with, you know, treatment. This is able to transport, the person is still going to go out there and do the work, but it's able to transport um, stuff, you know, it, several hundred or even a thousand pounds or more and go back to the farm or go back a, a mile away autonomously, pick up additional things. You're gonna need a person at the other end loading it or putting the things on, and then we'll find its way back out. So this has a lot of possibility. It's also being really mostly used right now in California. If you're working in an orchard or in a vineyard and you're a quarter mile into a vineyard and you've got baskets of grapes, what happens now is people put big baskets it's on their back or, or bags and they schlep them to the end of the field and then they have to head back empty. And now we're able to automate that a lot more and it's improving productivity by as much as like 30 to 50%. So again, lots, lots of things that are changing uh, very rapidly. Tom, do we typically go one hour? You can go as long as you want. Okay. Um, I do have a lot here. So I, 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 I want you to kind of like think about this because I do think that this will be something that we're all going to see within the next 10 years. Um, yes. Do you mind the question about our time? No, no, that's totally fine. Okay, so, so that video uh, from that case thing, which is really cool looking, said it was a concept vehicle. But I thought autonomous tractors were really in production and in use now. Yeah, yeah there time. are. There are production units that are in place. I'm actually gonna talk in a minute about some of the things that are happening out in California with regulation. That video, I'm not sure when that video was shot, but I actually was at the Farm Progress Show near, uh, near Des Moines, Iowa in 2015 when the, when the CNH concept vehicle was developed. Deer is moving now equally quickly. Deer acquired a company, or Case IH, acquired a company called Raven. Raven was small, but they were far advanced in terms of sprayer technology. So there are things, but I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a spoiler at the end. So a lot of farmers I meet with, um, they're super stressed out because it's fear of missing out, FOMO. And they think, oh, we're so far behind the times. But if you think about JFK back in 1961, he talked about about sending a person to the moon and back within the decade. Y'all remember that, right? Um, 
And that was like so, so formative for me as a young school age kid. I, I'd say if that was in 1961 and then it was reinforced a couple of years later with another speech, we're like maybe 63, 64. Uh, we're pretty early. There's a lot of things that have to happen before we really start to see it full scale. Uh, and maybe even a little bit longer than that until we see things out on the highway. Um, yeah, yeah. agreed. But like uh, on the highway, they're talking about big rig trucks because highways are easier than city streets. And truck, they would have truck drivers, they could just carry loads of trucks. Yeah. But I thought I thought I'd rather heard or understood that the kind of stretches were out there because that's even easier than highways because it's just yeah no when you're when you're out in the middle of a farm field it's pretty easy yeah. uh, until until something breaks down or until you have some sort of an unexpected situation and also the difference on highways you think well if you can if you can have FedEx within the next couple of years autonomously delivering packages well why why can't you have a tractor and a you know a, a twelve foot or a twenty two foot implement one of the big differences there is the speed differential and the additional risk remember the farm set farm accident data that I showed you earlier, a lot of those are on the highway. Mm -hmm. So gosh, man, we on farm safety things, we have so many different things to figure out. Um, but you're exactly right. You have something out in the field and it's basically going back and forth in roughly the same location it's been going back and forth for the last hundred years, or at least until we took the fence rows out, right? Um, that's really easy. Um, and it's also really easy with traditional farm equipment. And what I have found and investigated hundreds of deaths and injuries, it's not that stuff. It's not the going back and forth in the routine pattern. It's, it's breakdowns, it's unexpected environmental circumstances, those sorts of things that, that we get really worried about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna speed a little bit, okay? So if you want me to slow down, that's fine too. Yeah, go. Tom, I don't see anything from bulls in 1943, and I thought bulls were the most. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, great question. So, yeah, just uh, the idea of this slide things, things are seeming like, oh my gosh, they're changing so fast. We thought that back during the days of the transition from horses to tractors, but even that transition, like that did not happen overnight. That happened over like 40 or 50 years, not at least 30 to 40 years. And there was all kinds of pushback and that sort of thing. Um, from a safety perspective, yeah, 1943, I pulled these numbers up yes, yesterday, 116 fatalities. Remember, I think it's last year we had that 2020 was 28. Mm -hmm. So even though we are like, oh, we're so sad, it, it is a really tr tragic situation that 28 people die. We also have a lot fewer farmers in Wisconsin. We had 116 fatalities in 43, 82 were from horses, and the second highest number were from bulls. So with even with animal technology or the switch from horses and mules to tractors, we saw big improvements, although they did not happen overnight. We saw different types of accidents happening, right? Like you're not going to probably roll over and be killed by a horse, but we started to see people rolling over tractors and dying. And Tom, you mentioned bulls. Why don't we have as many bulls on farms now as we used to have? Artificial uh, insemination. Artificial insemination. So yet, a, yet another technology that really improved or had the potential to improve safety. Right now we're in a similar transition time. Um, this is a, 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 a I, yesterday on a Zoom, I referred to this as a yield monitor. This is a planter monitor. I remember when my dad, he had four a four row uh, uh, international harvester planter. And when he got his planter monitor, it's like, whoa, this is space age. And yet a planter monitor basically has a little beam of light and every time a seed drops through it, it breaks the beam of light and it changes the circuit and you can detect that on a monitor like this. Pretty simple, something my, my students could do in a lab in like 45 minutes if they did just basic wiring. We then went from that to GPS, to auto steer. Now these machines, including the milking robots are able to do self-diagnostics. They send text messages and they can directly contact the vendor or the service company if, if something out of the ordinary happens. And again, what this all means is we're, we're sort of glacially moving towards full-scale autonomy, but it will happen. For the naysayers that are out there, this is going to happen because the same things were being said by people who had ownership in horses. And we're like, oh, if we get rid of horses, like what is our family gonna do? Like, what's the job going to be of the person who's now caring for or shoeing horses? Well, you know, we kind of figured that out. 
From a safety perspective, this is a really important concept. Um, and I think it applies to all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. The idea of that pyramid on the, on the right-hand side, it's something called the safety hierarchy. The safety hierarchy is a pretty simple idea, but we don't do it very well. What it says is if there are hazards that we all live with in our daily lives, if we can find ways to eliminate that hazard entirely or change it through design in such a way that we separate the person from the hazard, the, ha the problem goes away. And I'll just give you a simple example. During the early months of COVID, we saw this dramatic reduction in highway fatalities in all states in the country. And part of that was we didn't have people on the highways driving. Um, not very practical, not a long-term solution. Um, I mean, although working from home is gonna play a role, I think, in our society. You know, the thing we could do is we could say like every person, their motor vehicle has its own track. And you share that track with 20 other families in Dane County. Ah, and we're gonna physically separate people just because everything is on a track and everything's gonna be computer controlled. That's not very practical, right? So if we can't design out the hazard, we're gonna to go to the next level of the hierarchy and that's safeguard devices. Thinking about the tractor, safeguarding devices are all the shields on the power takeoff shafts and the rollover protective structures on the tractor. Um, going back to my analogy of motor vehicles, what are some examples? Well, first of all, why don't we have everybody on their own, you know, like a monorail track with their motor vehicle? Huh? You don't get any parallel uh, advantages. Everything's in. And, there's all kinds of issues. It, it, there's a space issue. Like suddenly, every every square inch of Dane County will be vehicle tracks, right? So it's it's just impractical. And the impracticability part of it is it, impracticality part of it is also just about money. Um, so it's not always desired. So so the next thing, what about what about Safeguarding devices in your vehicles? Anybody have any that come to mind? Airbags, anti-lock braking systems. Now, if you buy a newer vehicle, I have a 2019 Toyota Corolla. I set the cruise control, I have a forward-looking radar. I had to turn this feature off because it kept telling me you might be drowsy and you might want to pull over, but we've also got lane detection and, and automated braking, all kinds of things. So, so the idea of the safety hierarchy is as you go further down. As you go further down the hierarchy, the efficacy or the effectiveness of safety becomes less and less, in some cases, almost exponential. You can also apply this to COVID, um, you know, PPE. We knew masks, like, they, yeah, they had an effect. We don't want to tell people go without PPE, but relative to finding ways to get rid of the hazard entirely or to protect people by safeguarding people through vaccines, um, it's just a concept and the idea with this is if we can move towards autonomous equipment and we tip it and we, we can take a person off of that potentially dangerous piece of equipment and you isolate them in distance or time, you can eliminate a, a lot of these different issues and problems. So that's one of the benefits, safety. Labor is another one. Remember that Gus sprayer? A, a typical farm or orchard, like an almond grower in California can reduce their labor needs for chemical application from two to one. If we're talking about a larger operation or a small scale custom provider, we're seeing more like a, we're going from eight workers down to two, so like a four to one reduction. And if we get to a large scale, like a large co-op or a customer custom service provider, we can see a five to one one reduction. The numbers, if you look up, if you look at my slide on the robot milker or the automated milking system, the benefits are not that dramatic. Um, there are labor saving benefits. And the other thing that people will tell you if they've gone toward more automation is you just shift the labor. You become much more of a technology operator, a troubleshooter. It still creates stress. You know, there's mental health stress when you're text messages are just one after the other, or you get a text in the middle of the night because one of your milking machines has gone down. So it doesn't totally eliminate some of these hazards and problems, but it does have the potential to make a difference. This is a short video. I just wanted to show you some couple of examples. Um, let, me, let me pause it because it's a little bit noisy. What you're seeing here is an automated 
weeder, a uh, mechanical weeder. So let me just ask you all a question. If I'm growing a high value vegetable crop, I think this might be cabbage if I'm not mistaken. This is like from a couple of weeks ago in California. Why might it be desirable to use mechanical cultivation versus just going in with a herbicide and killing weeds in that manner? Get a better price. Better price, big demand for organic um, and other types of low input. Uh, and that's part of it too, is just the, the cost input of chemicals and herbicides. Um, this machine, um, what kind of farm did you grow up on? Uh, chicken farm. Chicken farm, okay. I grew up, my dad was corn and soybeans. And when I first saw this machine in Fresno out there operating on this university farm, I thought, oh, that's not that big a deal. Like, I grew up driving the old 630 with the four row cultivator. And that's what I did. And what I didn't know is this machine is not only cultivating down between the rows of crops, but it's also going in between each plant. And what you don't, and, and it's using cameras, it's using artificial intelligence, it's using machine vision to recognize and know the difference between a plant and a weed. Oh. The other thing that is happening is there is, he's off camera now, but there's a man, a young man, uh, probably about 26, 27 years old. He's walking along with a, an iPad and he's making little small adjustments. He's watching what's happened. He's making sure that it's not going, you know, off row or whatever. Um, he's also able to communicate. There's another person off site remotely who is controlling this machine or has oversight of this machine, along with about five to 10 other machines in places like Yuma. He showed me his list. It was Yuma, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, in several areas in the valleys of California. And if this guy gets done with this field and is going to move that machine to another field, the person who's sitting in their office in San Francisco can say, okay, we're going from cabbage to romaine lettuce. Let's just upload the new crop model. And now everything again happens automatically. All the software gets adjusted. You might think, yeah, but you still got this guy walking along with his iPad behind or on the side of this machine. Like, what are we really doing? What we're doing is we are replacing 24 workers. Typically, this cabbage grower in California would have 24, probably work with a labor contractor. There'd be 24 workers who would come out. They would do all this by hand with a hoe, literally with a mechanical hoe, like you might have used as a kid growing up, or we probably still use in our gardens, right? Um, so we see a 24 to 1 um, worker advantage. We see that that young guy who grew up doing this work by hand 10 years ago as a 14-year-old, He's now being paid, instead of being paid at that time, $4.50 an hour, now he might be paid $12 an hour if he's doing it manually. He's going to go out here and he's going to make $30 an hour and kind of do some of the same type of work if he's got a passion for it. But he's now a technologist versus somebody who's only working with their body. Cost-wise, uh, $800 an acre for traditional manual hoeing down to $180 an acre otherwise. Um, this is another, I don't have sound with this. Can you, can you all see those little bright light things down yeah. at the bottom? So this is actually a laser weeder. So that's kind of like the next stage is actually identifying weeds using machine vision, burning them physically with a carbon dioxide laser. Um, from a safety perspective, like, ooh, like I would not want my dog out in the field with this machine. That'd be kind of scary. Very hot, very expensive, very high powered. And so one of the things we know about this equipment is it probably will be used by, I'm just going to call them people who do this sort of work on a custom basis, a subscription, like, you know, I'm going to have five times a year where they're going to bring the laser weeder out and weed my spinach or whatever that crop might be. That particular crop was spinach. It's very densely planted. So going in there with a hand hoe and, and plucking out weeds is almost impossible, but you can target things with a laser weed. Some other things sensitive to time here, reduced input costs, if I can eliminate chemicals or reduce chemical sustainability is important, increasingly important with consumers. We can also target resources where they're needed. I talked a little bit about 24 seven, nighttime operations. It's possible to use some of this tech technology for people who have physical or other types of disabilities and limitations. Um, this is, I think this is real important for Wisconsin. We have a huge issue um, with 
getting younger generations engaged in wanting to stay on the farm. And I do think that this sort of thinking differently about the use and application of technology does hold real potential. And that's not just John Shutsky saying that. This is talking with a lot of people who are my generation and a little bit older, and they're seeing this as a potential way to engage their children and grandchildren. And what's probably most important, this might be the only solution for people who can't find workers, um, ultimately moving toward more and more automation. Yes, but here, here are all my caveats. As a safety specialist, like this is not the perfect solution. Like there's a lot of different things. And so as a result of all these headwinds, we're gonna see this technology occur in fits and spurts. One of them is the safety issue. So Tom, that number that I showed you and you said bulls and I was talking about horses, is that 1943? Correct. Yeah, so we have data. We have data on farm accidents and farm injuries going all the way back to the early 1930s, I believe. If I'm an engineer and I, I teach in the classroom, by the way, I teach safety engineering and, and the design process. We tell our students, you got to do a risk assessment. If I'm going to put, it doesn't have to be farm equipment. It could be any type of new technology. It could be solar panels in Grant County. You got to do a risk assessment <clears throat> and look at all of the potential consequences and where people could get hurt or injured. That takes data. And if you're talking about something that's brand new, we don't have data. We don't know how likely it is that some uh, child is going to run underneath the laser weeder and be hurt or, or how often something is going to fail in the field. And especially what happens if it fails and it's a software failure? Um, what, if, what if it's a behavior that we were unable to predict because this AI and machine learning was learning, it was adjusting its algorithms over time and with experience and suddenly we have something that we, we did not expect. So from a safety perspective, this is the area of my work is how do you do risk assessment in the absence of having data. Uh, and you know, all these numbers that we have, how do you actually go about doing this in a way that's robust and that people are gonna trust? I think I'm gonna come back to that in a second. California, this is a huge issue. Trust is a big issue. California, that's, um, that's a tractor. That's a fully autonomous tractor. It's manufactured by a company called Monarch. They've manufactured a number of these units. They petitioned the California OSHA board because the Cal OSHA board, they had this old rule from 1970s that said, you have to have a person in the seat of that tractor at all times, because there had been a case in the, in the early 70s where a worker, guy was, he was actually had his wheel wedged against the furrow and jumped off the tractor. And I think they were dealing, they were possibly harvesting crops and a worker was run over and killed. So there was a new regulation that was passed and said, always gotta have a person in the seat at all times. Well, obviously, the whole idea of autonomy is so that you don't have a person in the seat. So they ruled against this in California. This is like a huge, like, you know, multi, like this was New York Times and Washington Post and places like that. Also interesting that the California OSHA board includes labor. There's a lot of interest in, in workers and the workers unions. So there's probably a political and job security element of this well. But the big thing was about trust. They said, yeah, you presented us with a thousand hours worth of operating <clears> data, <throat> but we, that, that's not enough. Like we don't feel comfortable moving forward with what you've provided us from a risk assessment perspective. Um, I worry about, this is about environmental risk. What happens if I have a piece of equipment that's spreading a chemical or fertilizer or manure? Fully autonomous, no operator person tips over or, or a, a vehicle tips over. Then we've got an environmental catastrophe. Um, some of my research has shown that when people tip equipment over out in the field, in 85% of the instances, it is an experienced operator as deemed by investigators and by family members and survivors. So software, is going to have to be as at least as sophisticated as an experienced human operator. And that's a really, really tall order to have to, to achieve. Ultimately, highway travel is going to need to be tackled because it's impractical. So many farms, you're literally going from field to field, from farmstead to farmstead. So this whole idea of highway travel, 
Right now it would not be legal in Wisconsin, <coughs> at least with farm equipment. And it is something that our regulatory community, I think is gonna to have to wrestle with in the coming years. Other stuff, cybersecurity. Oh my God, what happens if I spend $1.5 million on a new autonomous tractor and somebody is able through the internet or other means to hack into it? They may not even have to do anything, um, you know, malicious, except what if they brick it? You know, some of you have probably had computers or phones where something happens and it suddenly becomes unusable. Uh, viruses, those kinds of things. So that's, that's an increased issue. Uh, just have a few more slides, Tom. Broadband access, access to talent are two more. Um, let me just, this one, broadband access, you go out to various areas, even on the perimeter of Dane County, you can't use your cell phone. This drives me crazy. Um, I don't know if anybody lives up uh, in the town of Dane. The intersection, I can't even think of for sure what it is. One road goes north, and then the other one is right there. I think there's a BP. You can see the state capitol, but I can't use my smartphone. And how do you run a business if you can't make phone calls, if you can't connect your equipment? Uh, farmers are obviously, they're finding workarounds. Um, by the way, Starlink, what they're using in Ukraine, the Elon Musk system, that's not the answer. Starlink works really well if you can afford it in a, in a stationary setting. But if I start driving around or have a piece of mobile equipment, I can't use Starlink. I'll probably be able to here in a few years or by the end of 2023. But even then, we're talking about two to four megabytes per second. Good enough for making a phone call, not good enough to operate some fancy piece of equipment. Access to talent is another one. I'm going to actually skip this slide. Well, let me say this. You see, these, are, these are barriers for farmers. These are, I think, 1,021 farmers. People say, I'm not able to keep up with the technology change. And we were simply asking about smartphones, using YouTube for education, laptop computers, spreadsheets. So this stuff we're talking about goes way beyond that. So that's another barrier that we're going to have to overcome. This survey, we just published this just within the last month or so. We looked at 400 agricultural service providers, and you see that there's a huge concern about lack of like expertise in our rural and farming communities. Um, so we're talking about struggling to find immigrant and migrant and other seasonal like farm workers. We also have to be able to find technology talent to make this thing work. So that's why like, you know, all this cool stuff and laser readers and fully autonomous big giant tractors that seem really fun, but there's gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna to have to overcome. I do think that this is an amazing opportunity for our technical colleges. I'm gonna be talking, I think it's on December 7th at Fox Valley Technical College with agricultural people and manufacturing people because I think there's an opportunity there to come together. Uh, we need to be thinking about trust, worker and workforce trust. I'm actually going to skip this slide. If you know people who are farming and they're thinking about new technology, it's really critical that they engage their workforce if you're going to make something work in your system. Um, there also needs to be trust and understanding between farmers and engineers, inventors, technology who are deciding to be more fully automated. We're not talking talking about this, I have a hard time spending I-99 for an app on my cell phone because I'm not quite sure if it's going to work for me. I, I Years ago, I didn't hesitate to spend $99, or $99 on a piece of software for my laptop, but now I can't even do $999. In some of these cases, we're talking about multiple, multiple millions of dollars of investment. That includes economic trust, knowing that I'm actually going to get the ROI that I think I might get over a multiple year period. So we really need, Tom, this is my, this is my call out to like UW Extension. Like we really need to be looking at this from an economics and management perspective. If people are making these decisions, somebody needs to help producers walk through this stuff. Um, yeah, second to the last slide. And I think this is like throughout all of society, there's, there's a, a researcher and risk communication expert. His name is Peter Salmon. I still love that guy's name. He was a professor, I believe, at Rutgers University. Is that right? And Sandman, he talked a lot about the same things I talk about, like hazard, 
how, what's the probability, what's the frequency, what's the severity if somebody gets hurt. But he also talked about this factor that he calls outrage. And the idea of outrage is when something happens or when there is risk or a risk-filled environment or situation, there are things that happen that are very emotional. I'll just give you one really, really quick example. So remember I said 12,000 injuries on farms. So since I've been talking, there have probably been a handful of farmers and farm workers in Wisconsin who have been injured. If one of those injuries is a child, a, a little boy or a little girl, it's gonna probably make the local news. If it's somebody, if it's an old guy, my age, probably, you know, it, it may make like third page, like two or three weeks after when they're, when they're trying to raise money to pay for my hospital bills. Mm -hmm. But it is probably not going to engender the level of outrage as we see with children. There are a whole bunch of things with autonomous vehicles. I'm not just talking farm vehicles. I'm talking about motor vehicles also. You think you talked about delivery vans on the highway. There's a lot of things that when we do begin to see those collisions and accidents, um, they're going to they're going to generate a lot of outrage and outrageous risk can cripple a project, technology, or change efforts. Some of the things, these are so prevalent when we talk about autonomous equipment, things that are industrial versus natural, especially when we use the term robot. Gosh, is there anything more industrial in space age than a robot? Exotic versus familiar. I talked about Highway P and Mineral Point. If there's a collision, somebody runs into the back of a 1966 John Deere 4020 pulling a forage box. Like we can totally, that's totally familiar. If this is a vehicle and there's no operator, that's going to be considered pretty exact. Unknowable versus knowable. So we talk about artificial intelligence. We don't always know what's going on with some of this, these new forms of software. So that's another thing that's going to generate a lot of concern. And finally, memorable versus non-memorable. I do get, I, and I think that this, this will happen in my lifetime. And I hate to be like, you know, magic forecast or magic ball, whatever, but there will be a situation in the future where there will be a software or mechanical failure with one of these pieces of equipment, and it may wander onto a public highway or into a farmyard where there's a couple of kids who are playing, and that will be incredibly memorable. And it probably has the potential to set this industry back. So so I'm working a lot with these companies, with other people in research. Uh, the risk communication part of it is really crucial. With all of this new stuff, we got to do it right because it's only going to take one or two really bad screw ups, and it's going to it's going to like probably stop us in our tracks for a period of time. This is what I talked about JFK 1961. Um, we do have these huge challenges. So just like when Kennedy was president, we were worried about Sputnik and the Soviet Union and stuff. We have equally big challenges right now. We got to feed, was it 9.5 to 10 billion people by the year 2050? So technology, it's not is likely, technology will have to play some type of role. That includes genetic technology and other types of um, things that are more at the biological and chemical level, but, but mechanical technology is going to play a role. We have to do it right and with the degree of trust and the safety that is really demanded by our society. I went 10 minutes after, no, 10 minutes fine. over. Yeah. Um, do you, any of you have questions, comments? Are, are, I'm, I love to debate, I don't wanna say arguments. Uh, debate. <laughs> so I got a cultural one, you know, I uh, don't have deep roots into uh, the farm community. My family left uh, farm five generations ago. But I spent some time on, uh, you know, dairy farms in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and the culture is <laughs> very, very conservative. Yeah. Sometimes deadly conservative. Yeah. And when you see all of these changes come, and a bunch of people in California who talk with them, uh -huh. do this stuff, are they going to simply push all the farmers in the Midwest or whatever off into the ocean? On the other end, as they plow through with it. Yeah. Technology. Will you be able to work with the farmers in Wisconsin to reform the way they do things? Yeah, no, I think it's a really, really good question. I don't see, 
I don't see California interests pushing in this direction. I, I do see that the continued you know, growth of individual farms, the ability of people, it, it's gonna take, you know, what, what do you call it? Professional development, education, training background. I see that there are 100 to 250 farms in the state of Wisconsin. And that's not just dairy farms, that's all farms. Eventually things are going to become very much more consolidated and they may, may, may or may not be, be people who grew up in Wisconsin. I know when I lived in Minnesota, we had a lot of people coming over from Europe and buying up farmland. And there was part of it was about some, they had some different ideas. By the way, when they came into that community, their different ideas oftentimes were not really popular. Um, there's also this whole idea of the diffusion of innovation. I don't know if you've heard or read about that, where you, in any type of technology, you have people on the very edge who are either innovators or early adopters. And the innovators, um, and I think the first group after that is called the early majority. My dad was like right in the middle. Those innovators are do they're beginning to tinker with and do a lot of this stuff. They're doing the self-drive, not self-driving, but a, a lot of the assisted steering and a lot of the using their GPS and monitoring things. It's only like one percent of the population, and they're oftentimes labeled as kind of wacko. Uh, I mean, that not just in farming, but you know, they're the ones like, whoa, they're He's really out there, but they're also the ones that kind of pull those other groups um, more into the middle, but that might take eight, 10, 12 years worth of time. Don't you think uh, the younger generation are already, they uh, iPhone, they can't live without. Yeah. They all have computers. They're kind of, as the older farmers retire, Right. Maybe the younger are more receptive. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And if, I'm just going to jump back to this little chunk of data right here. When we look at all these different things about ability to keep up with technology change, how likely are you to adopt? Uh, uh, one of the questions we had in our survey is how likely are you to use video, uh, YouTube videos to further your professional development in farming? You look at the 20, 30, and 40 year olds, it's like, 98%. You look at people who were my age and older, I always used to say older than me, now I've got to say my age and older, and that number dropped to like 15%. So I do, I do think that the younger generation is going to demand it. I thought when you were going to go with your question, my, my dad, he lived for springtime corn planting and fall harvest season. And, and I, you know, the last full season I spent with my dad, I went back after 9-11, this was 2001, and I spent a full week, it's the most beautiful week, and so memorable. I've got millions, hundreds of pictures from that week. The Christmas, the corn, listening to the Purdue Notre Dame football game and the combine. Like, I live for that. I can remember being like in eighth grade, driving the tractor, listening to Paul McCartney Band on the Run, and like plowing late at night, listening to Reggie Jackson uh, hit home runs during the World Series in the mid-1970s. 77. 77. There, and there are a lot of people, I you was know, 16, because I remember driving to pick up home because I had to go home and study for a quiz. Um, there are a lot of people who I think are going to miss that sort of thing. But a little bit of that does go a long way, um, especially when you're trying to leverage these kind of assets and resources. <laughs> 77, it's good to be with the, It was with the Yankees, right? George Jackson was the Yankees, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like um, at least my impression is that uh, one factor that, that kind of separates farmers for both for profitability and uh, accidents is the ability to like, repair that machinery during the winter time. Yeah. Because uh, it's like uh, if you can keep your you know very expensive piece of machinery going for a few more years, well, that's, yeah. that's money in the bank for you. If you don't right. know what you're doing, you're going to mess it up and you have to replace it. Or worse yet, you know, like fall down on you while you're sure. underneath it. Um, right. But with the newer uh, mm -hmm. things, it seems like like the, the individual farmer is going to be pretty much taken out of the picture as far as we yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm for the Zoom, I'm going to just repeat that. What about the ability to repair this equipment? You know, that has safety implications. It also has economic implications. 
there is a whole debate and I could do a whole presentation on this called right to repair. So, so many of the electronic and electrical systems, electronic and computerized systems on this machinery that we currently have operating in places like Dane County today, people, individual farmers are not able to go in and tinker with and repair a lot of the components and systems because they are either proprietary, they require special tools, they require special software. And that's created, you know, it's called right to repair. That's generated a lot of like ugh, angst with people. And I will tell you, I, I gave this answer in front of an audience in Champaign-Urbana and there were like several people from one of the companies who have been squarely in the target of this. My answer was, you can do a lot of, especially as we move towards autonomy, you can do a lot of uh, unexpected or unanticipated damage. I don't know if anybody here has ever tried to like, you got a, you got an old, like a desktop computer and you try to put new RAM in it or you try to put a new graphics card and you start it back up and you get this like black screen of death. And it's because maybe you have created some type of crosstalk or maybe one piece of software isn't working with another or you've got outdated drivers. And I think that's really what's driving a lot of these concerns. If it's just like, oh, I can't get it started back up. Now I've got to go ahead and call the John Deere dealer on it. That's one thing. If I make a change like that and it somehow messes with the software and I'm out there operating or I'm autonomously operating and suddenly that thing decides it's going to leave the field boundaries and go out on the public highway and cross the road, that's a whole other ball game. So um, just want to, this is interesting to me. I mean, forgive me for, it's kind of like your iPhone. With my iPhone, I pretty much, if I'm going to do anything major, I either have to go into the Apple, it's called the iStore, you know, the Apple store to get my apps and stuff like that. I can use a Android and it's much more open. I can, I can customize it and do all kinds of cool things and do a lot of like do it yourself. And that debate right now is playing out in the agricultural machinery industry. Like, do we want an Apple type model or do we want an Android model where you can customize add features, and there are safety implications associated with that. Yeah. Just to comment, I've um, read and heard that Bill Gates is the largest private landowner, farm landowner in the country. Are you aware, is he involved in this in any way? I am quite way? sure that Bill Gates is quite involved and definitely tracking and probably making investments. I don't know that he's needing <laughs> to invest in places like the big companies that I showed you pictures of, but I know he's quite, He's quite aware that all these possibilities exist. So I have a question here from the chat. Um, did International Harvester one-door tractors have any safety issues? And he's specifically referring to IH5488 with only one factory door. <laughs> did they have any safety issues, right? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I do recall um, a situation where having a two-door tractor was quite important to me, uh, involved in applying anhydrous ammonia. And on my left-hand side was a, we had a hose rupture, a huge cloud. I stopped the tractor. Had I jumped out, I would have jumped right into the cloud. Being able to get out the other door was important. I also think that having multiple exit and entrance points egress and get on points on tractors yeah. and machinery can also be quite important if you have a fire um, in, the, in the wrong place. You don't want to jump into a fire. So having an alternative exit is important. But I've not ever like seen papers that talk about the, the relative risk. Perfect. Organic farming in Wisconsin is seemingly growing. Is that being affected at all? As much, I don't really know how to Yeah, it's, yeah. Do you want me to kind of sort of repeat the question, yeah, Tom? Sure. Yeah, so the question about organic farming in Wisconsin, we're, we're a big organic producing state. I think we actually, when you throw in organic dairies, I think we actually, we don't produce the most product in the country, but I think we have like one of the states with the largest number of operations. Um, some of these pieces of equipment, remember the laser weeder? Farmer, an organic farmer that grows for a farmer's market or for, you know, Woodman's or wherever it might be, they're not going to have a million and a half dollars to go out and buy a laser meter. 
Um, but they may you know, be part of a cooperative where there's multiple, multiple farms that are involved and in being able to benefit from technology like this. I also think that there's some opportunities. This is why I'm gonna to go to Fox Valley. Technical college, I think that there's opportunities for manufacturers to get out and like, let's go spend time with farmers and figure out what their pain points are, what their needs are. And there may be some technologies that are equally accessible. And instead of one and a half million, maybe it's 150,000 spread across three or four farms, there might be some opportunities there. And, and, and there are, I've talked a little bit with some of my friends in extension in the fruit vegetable industry. Cranberries is another one. Like, yeah, we wouldn't mind like having some more conversations about what might be possible for our industry. Yeah. Yeah, with um, these autonomous vehicles, do they just rely on GPS for determining their location or is there something else like an invisible fence? Or yeah, no, you're, you're correct. G GPS is kind of like a base, uh, but then they're also, you know, for looking at things like obstacle detection, uh, looking at terrain, slopes, things like that, they're, they are very dependent on um, ooh, battery. I think we're okay there. Uh, li something called LIDAR. Um, yeah. LIDAR is like radar, but you're using light beams instead of radio waves. I think we're okay, Tom. Okay. Other, any other questions? So doing all this stuff at night. You know, I, I'm actually, I'm going to go back and grab my battery pack. Okay. I wouldn't need time to just die. <laughs> but you can go ahead if you want. Um, Doing all the crop growth things at night is going to be very interesting how that's going to affect. I'm a, originally trained as a plant pathologist, and going out in wet crops in due times is going to be very different than going out in the middle of the day. And I'm wondering uh, who gets to look into that um, stuff. Or is yeah, no, that's a great question. The physio plant physiology, environmental questions. Uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why spraying at night is desirable is because of less less um, evaporation mm -hmm. and also evaporation. Oh, and also just less heat and, and less wind. So I'm able to, it's gonna be far less windy at night. So I'm able to really target things quite specifically. And maybe in the orchard situations, people have been doing it, and I don't know because I'm asleep, um, and I don't drive at night <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, but that'd be very interesting to see. Yeah. What round the clock? Yeah, I think you know, like do. I think for our pathologists, entomologists, horticulturalists, agronomists on our campus, I think they're. Yeah. I think we have a lot of opportunity to. It's not just the cool machinery and software. There's yeah, some biology guys. Another just really quick example. So I met this inventor. She's one of these people who had never been on a farm before, but she heard about in the almond industry. After you have mechanically harvested almonds, you don't want to leave any residual almonds hanging from the tree. And the reason for that is that small insects are able to get in there and basically you have an infestation of insects that have overwintered or have spent the rest of the season in an almond, they call them mummies. So they're basically an almond that survived through the season. So she developed a machine that would go down through the, the orchard and it would identify using machine vision, these mummies, these little hanging almonds, and it would shoot them down with a little biodegraded little BB. <laughs> and this is all true. And the reason why doing that at night is desirable is because you don't have to account for as much wind. You know, you can just a tiny little deflection in the wrong place of one of these little mummy BBs, whatever they're called. Uh, it's the difference between success and failure. So there's these kind of weird things wow. that they're using for these machines at night. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. If not, thank you very much. Thank you.